Now is the winter of our discontent and all the clouds that lured upon our house. As blood pooled in the Bataclan and spilled upon the streets of Paris, we watched, we read, we listened in horror, for the screams of many were heard upon our streets and the echoes of fear resounded in our hearts. The instant terror, images relayed through fiber optic cable bouncing from satellite to satellite, magnified an atrocity with every click and scroll. The same cables, the same satellites, which Islamic radicals had used to plot and menace. Europe has known many demonic attacks, the crazed pursuit of a greater glory, but today we live in a changed era. It is no longer the sound of artillery fire in the distance, but a sense that the enemy is within our schools, our workplaces, our shopping centers, our theaters. But is our sense of suspicion leading to an overreaction which risks the primary values of our Western society? Is our response to the Paris attacks on lockdown in Brussels balanced, careful and proportionate? Terrorists don't know any borders and they don't have in fact a nationality. <coughs> Extreme uh, jihadism is about that. So or we continue like we are doing now, so we are fighting against something that no, no borders with systems that are based, based on, on, on borders. And that doesn't work. The answer is real cooperation and not bringing, I would say, old phantoms about closing ourselves within our borders and with all the walls. That's not an answer. The aim of terrorism is to shut down our values. Therefore, yes, we might need additional security measures, but, but we have to handle them very carefully. In November, David Cameron, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, announced an intelligence agency budget rise of 2.7 billion euros over five years to counter the Islamic State's use of the internet for planning, propaganda and cyber attacks Cameron also pledged to hire 1,900 new spies. It's just one example of European nations developing an offensive capability against hackers, terrorists, criminals and rogue states engaged in hybrid conflict. This is going to be the 21st century battleground. You know, whether it's crime, whether it's whatever you want to call it, this is, this is where it's at. Digital crime is where it's going to be for the bad guys. Belgian Prime Minister Charles Michel is just one of a growing band of European leaders calling for the creation of a European Central Intelligence Agency to maximize the exchange of sensitive information and to fight criminality across Europe's borders. All mainstream EU leaders agree on the need for more data sharing, but the range and depth of that sharing is still a matter of sharp differences. Today, a debate rages as to how flexible our human rights should be as we seek to maintain our security. Everyone who was involved in these terrorist attacks, they already had a criminal register. So the thing is that if there were already criminal registers from these people, why didn't the national authorities communicate in such a way that these people were not able to do what they did. We have Europol, that's police cooperation. We have Eurojust, that is uh, cooperation uh, on the level of the judiciary. We need also cooperation uh, on the level of intelligence. Do we need new laws and do we need fewer freedoms to ensure our security? and prosperity. Vouloir mettre l'intégralité de nos sociétés sous surveillance constante est à la fois inadéquate et démocratiquement inacceptable. Inadéquate parce que ce n'est pas le renseignement qui manque, mais bien son partage et son exploitation. Inacceptable parce que en démocratie, il y a un principe de base qui est la proportionnalité entre les mesures que l'on prend et l'effet recherché et que rien ne peut justifier la mise en surveillance généralisée de nos sociétés. La Chine l'essaye et ne parvient pas à empêcher les actes terroristes. We need to come together to develop our response, but a response that must be measured and proportionate. For if every time they attack us, we erode our freedoms, there may eventually be no freedoms to defend. Cyber terrorism isn't simply about the hacking of computers to steal personal information. At its core, cyber terrorism threatens our everyday infrastructure. For Europe's enemies, the electricity grid is the ideal target. 
we actually found examples whereby criminals were selling access to hydroelectric plants to anybody willing to pay. Now, that transcends crime, you know, the, the, the traditional cybercrime element, because the implications could be significant. Disrupt the electricity network and civilized society comes to an immediate halt. Without electricity, there's no capacity to pump water, no food production, no light, heat, or healthcare. Without electricity, society will disintegrate quickly, which is why the UK is investing so much in a new cyber counterterrorism operation. There is no silver bullet to this. It, it, it is, it, you know, securing our borders, securing our infrastructure is a process. And we've seen enormous innovation from criminals. We are in this game of, this constant game of cat and mouse, whereby we innovate, we innovate, and they innovate. The contentious passenger name records data sharing system is a clear example of the ideological battle within Europe. In November, just days after the bloody Paris attacks, and while Brussels was still on lockdown, the European Parliament's centre-right political group accused the Social Democrats of being soft on terrorism because of its failure to support the sharing of passenger information. We should be very careful when we are discussing about the European PNR. This is something where the European Commission has to bring a new proposal. We are not against it, but we have to protect our fundamental rights. Sweeping mass collection of data like this is not uh, uh, efficient f for the goals of, of identifying uh, criminals. And it's also in, not in convergence with the, the protection of data integrity for, for, for uh, European citizens. Le PNR, euh, oui, ça ne va pas tout empêcher, mais le PNR permettrait d'avoir une traçabilité et euh, une mobilité, la, euh, suivre la mobilité des individus, notamment signalés, surveillés ou fichés. It's very clear that after the judgment of the court on retention directive, the Commission has to come up with ideas what this will mean, what influence it will have on a PNR proposal. On that basis, then, we can decide what is necessary and what should be done. In the confidential letter seen by Euronet, French Prime Minister Manuel Valls urges Gianni Patella, Social Democrat President in the European Parliament, to immediately agree to PNR. Valls wrote, It is vital that by the end of the year we adopt a text on the creation of the EU passenger name record. In truth, if we cannot do this, there can be no justification in the view of our public opinions. I therefore fear that certain member states will use intergovernmental channels. The Commission and Council are concluding negotiations, and if Pitello's Social Democrats agree, passenger data sharing will become an almost immediate reality throughout Europe. To protect Europe's essential services, do we need to allow the intelligence agencies access to all our online data? Is this the best way to weaken terrorist activity? Or does the loss of privacy mean a loss of freedom? Cette austérité, elle nous a obligé à nous désarmer. C'est à cause de l'austérité que l'Union européenne a imposé aux pays que nous avons moins de militaires, que nous avons moins de policiers, que nous avons moins de gendarmes, que nous avons moins de douaniers. The political declarations that we heard over the last days and last weeks are closer to a police state, but I hope not. I hope that uh, equality, freedom and other values will still be the European values and not the war against everyone and no one at the same time. Talking about anti-terrorism is talking about freedoms and democracies. We have to focus on education, on raising the awareness, on bringing communities together, on talking about European values. During 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland, 3,600 people were killed and many more injured. The conflict was finally reduced to a simmering tension, not by military might, but by decades of exhaustive human intelligence. British and Irish intelligence agencies infiltrated the IRA so deeply that senior members of the Irish Republican movement, such as Dennis Donaldson, were used to undermine the group from within. Donaldson, a close associate of the Sinn Féin leader, Jerry Adams, was later shot dead because of his treachery, but the information he and others provided helped end the conflict. It was a kind of hybrid warfare. Critical to the peace process was huge investment in the Northern Irish economy, and Europe played a critical role in the redevelopment of Northern Ireland's economy, reviving diminished and deprived communities and cities. One of the terrorists involved in the Paris attacks 
spent his night and drinking alcohol and smoking cannabis. And another ne never went to the mosque. Two British terrorists ordered a book before they fled for Syria last year, Islam for Dummies. Yet all these terrorists claim to be carrying out these acts in the name of Islam, prepared to slaughter innocent people on a Friday night in Paris. Today Europe is faced with the same challenge. The need to know its enemies intimately, to understand their capacity. ISIS and other threats to Europe cannot be absolutely crushed, but they can be contained. Doing so will require massive new intelligence investment and a strong element of economic restructuring. If it concerns a question of sovereignty or security, well, I think that uh, politicians have to uh, put security before sovereignty. Today, our firewall should be human rights, reinforced with a just legal process and proportionality. Now is the winter of our discontent, but our laws should be fit for all seasons.